Okay, if we could turn in our Bibles uh, this morning to the book of uh, Revelation and chapter 10, Revelation chapter 10. I'm going to read the entire chapter, and we're going to consider it together. So beginning in verse 1, it says, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was, as it were, the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth for ever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and in the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And again, God will add a blessing to the reading of his precious word to us today. I want to give a title for the section we're going to be looking at. I want to think about opened up, eaten up, and sealed up. <laughs> Three different things. Now we're going to see a book that's opened up, an open book, and then he's told to eat it up. And then finally, there's going to be these seven thunders that are sealed up. So opened up, eaten up, sealed up. And so we've already observed last time, if you remember from last week, that this mighty angel, even though it has features connected with it, uh, like being clothed with a cloud and a rainbow on his head and a face was it were the sun, his feet as pillars of fire, that might cause us to think that this angel is Christ. But we have rejected that idea. Uh, we believe that just even the beginning, I saw another, and the word another is another of the same kind, another mighty angel, another like the ones that we've seen previously uh, in this uh, this book in chapter 5 and verse 2, and then we'll see again in chapter 18 and verse 21, it's just a sequence of these strong angels or mighty angels, and he's coming as, as it were, a representative, a messenger from the throne, and he has invested in him some of kind of the authority connected with the throne, and so he has come down from heaven to convey a message and actually to make a claim on behalf of the throne. And that's what we're going to focus on today. But I want you to notice now, because we, we covered much of that last time. Look at verse 2. It says, And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, his left fat foot on the earth. So we want to think about this little book uh, that's open. It's good to notice it's an open book. That means that it may be read. Uh, that it's it's a, it's available. By the way, it's good to have an open book, isn't it? Good to have the Word of God open and to consider it. Uh, and so the, this book is open. And so we want to uh, think a little bit about the book. Uh, some have suggested that this open book uh, is the seven 
sealed scroll uh, that we saw in chapter five. Uh, I have somewhat of a difficulty with that because if you remember uh, in Revelation five, we said that that book was the title deed to planet earth. And so it would be very strange uh, if uh, I know sometimes you'll, you'll hear people say uh, they, they, they had written their homework but the dog ate it, <laughs> and uh, that was their excuse for not doing their homework. Well, the dog ate it. Well, imagine you have the title deeds to a property, and you go into the lawyers and say, well, actually, um, I I'd like to present you these title deeds, but, um, but John the Apostle ate it, <laughs> because John is told to eat it. And so it seems to me highly unlikely that it is the title deeds to planet Earth that is found in this little title deed, this little book, uh, this little book that John uh, is <clears throat> being shown in the hands of the angel. So we might ask the question what it is, and we'll try and answer that shortly. But first of all, I want you to notice that not only does he have this little book open, uh, he also has a, a particular stance. He has a right foot on the sea and a left foot on the earth. And, and we're going to suggest to you that in this, this uh, chapter, it's a parenthetical chapter, and this angel on behalf of Christ is going to claim creation for the Lord Jesus. Remember, he, he already has the title deeds. Now a legal claim is being asserted. And so he's putting his foot on the sea and the earth and claiming these things for the Lord Jesus. Uh, he has the right to it. He, he is the one who is worthy uh, to open the sealed book and uh, to, to reign on the earth. And so that claim is being made. Notice, too, that it, verse 3, it says that this angel cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. So the loud cry of a voice of the angel is accompanied by this stand and this little book in his hand, and he roars like when a lion roars. And again, the thought of uh, the lion is, the, uh, is the, the king of beasts, and so there's kind of tremendous authority in that roar. And Old Testament imagery would suggest that Jehovah is roused to judgment. So perhaps something about this book is connected with judgment. Let me show you the Old Testament imagery about a lion roaring and how it's connected with Jehovah being roused to judgment. And so look at the book of Hosea, the first book in the what we call the Minor Prophets, right after the book of Daniel. Hosea and chapter 11 and verse 10, where we read this reference, it says, Then shall walk, they shall walk after the Lord, he shall roar like a lion. When he shall roar, then the children, the children shall tremble from the west. They shall tremble as a bird out of Egypt and as a dove out of the land of Assyria, and I will place them in their houses, saith the Lord. And again, it's connected with divine judgment on the Assyrians and <clears throat> the return of the nation of Israel. And so again, connected with judgment. Look at Joel, next book over, Joel chapter 3 and verse 16. Again, this language of a lion roaring, uh, connected to Jehovah being roused to judgment. It says, in verse 16 of chapter 3 of Joel, the Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So in both cases, we've got a similar picture. Uh, God is roaring. He's roaring against the enemies, but he's also uh, roaring. He's going to bring forth his prophecies uh, concerning his people, Israel. And certainly, I think we have both ideas here in this thought uh, in chapter 10 and verse 3, uh, that this angel, it's a delegate from the throne, cries with a loud voice as when a lion roars. So let me again make this suggestion concerning this little book. And uh, for help in this, I want us to go to the book of Job. 
again, Job chapter 31, to try and think about what is this book really about, this little book in the angel's hand that's open. Job 31 and verse 35, Job says this, Oh, that one would hear me. Behold, my desire is that the Almighty would answer me and that mine adversary had written a book. And what, he, what he's looking for, what Job is looking for is uh, he, he wished his adversaries had a book, uh, a, a kind of a, with, with the charges that they are leveling against Job, uh, you know, kind of in an official capacity, uh, the legal document or charge sheet uh, produced against Job. If, so, if somebody had just written that in a book, he's saying. And so I want to suggest to you that what this little book is in the right hand of this angel is God's legal charge sheet against the earth dwellers and against planet earth. And, and he's bringing his charges against them, his legal document against them. He's about to act in judgment. And, and notice it says, when he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth, when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And so we want to think a little bit about the seven thunders. Now, one interesting suggestion is that, first of all, uh, what God is about to act in judgment, and there's an immediate response to the throne, to these charges against planet Earth, and seven thunders from heaven. But the suggestion is, is this, that the seven thunders, if you look back at Psalm 29, we might get some help on what these seven thunders are connected with. And again, it's to do with judgment. In, in Psalm 29, we, we get the phrase, the voice of the Lord, mentioned seven times in Psalm 29, starting in verse 3. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. Verse 4, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Verse 5, the voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars, yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. Verse 7, the voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. Verse 8, the voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. Uh, the Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. Verse 9, the voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to carve and discovereth the forests. And in his temple doth every one speak of his glory. And then verse 10, and this gives a nice connection. The Lord sitteth upon the flood. And that word flood there is the very same word that is connected with the flood of Noah. It's exactly the same word. And could it be that Psalm 29 is a, a psalm that talks about God's judgment in the flood? And the seven thunders, or the voice of the Lord seven times, is the idea of seven is the number of perfect or completeness, and it's the complete judgment that God has upon the earth during the time of the flood. Now, here we are in the book of Revelation, and once again, there are seven thunders that have been made. And could it be that, again, this book is, is this indictment on planet earth, and God is about to bring catastrophe on planet earth because this is again kind of pr preparing the way for the final seven judgments remember the seven bull judgments and so the, the thought is this that god is about to judge the earth he's he's bringing the legal charges in this little book uh, that is in the angel's hand uh, heaven is thundering because god is about to move to judgment and so perhaps Psalm 29 gives us at least an indication of what is going on here, that once again, he's going to visit the earth with cataclysmic judgments to engulf creation, and the, the thunders herald the coming storm that will come upon the earth. Now, notice it says in verse 4, when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And so, again, this is, this is very interesting because it tells us how we got the book of Revelation. Obviously, John, even though he's caught up to heaven, 
has got a pen in his hand. <laughs> and as he's seeing these things, he's writing them down. And you can imagine him, he's God's secretary, he's writing all these things down uh, that God is telling him. And that's how we know that we, we this is from God, that we have uh, how we got it. It was John is about to write down. And so I was about to write, but in this occasion, I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. Obviously, what was uttered was very clear because John understood it, was about to write it, but he's told not to write it down. So again, we don't know the full of details of the seven thunders. We've made a suggestion from Psalm 29 that God's thunders is because he's about to bring cataclysmic judgments on the earth. But uh, sometimes God, who does reveal much to us, sometimes he sees fit to not reveal everything to us. And so this is sealed up. And so we get a gist of what's going on. Uh, it's kind of like an iceberg. You, you only see the bit at the top, but there's a lot more to this that God doesn't want us to know. So he tells him, write them not. And so we'll, we won't know until eternity uh, what the full extent of these were. Then notice it says, the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven. Now, this is a, a familiar picture because it's a picture of somebody about to take an oath or swear an oath. And so he's about to raise his hand to heaven. And so notice, please, just again, we want to look at the Old Testament, Genesis 14. We want to see uh, how this posture uh, symbolizes the taking of an oath. And so Genesis 14 and verse 22 and 23 it says, Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread, even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abraham rich. So Abraham takes this posture, right? Raises his hand and swears by heaven that he's not going to take uh, anything. From the king of Sodom. Look at the book of Deuteronomy now. Deuteronomy chapter 32. We're just looking at this posture of a raised hand uh, and how it symbolizes somebody about to take a solemn oath before God, to swear before God. And so Deuteronomy 32, verse 40 and 41. We read these words. It says, for I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. If I wet my glittering sword and mine hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to mine enemies and will reward them that hate me. So again, taking of an oath is in view here. And then one more, the book of Daniel, and very kind of similar in many ways in Daniel chapter 12. The book of Daniel and chapter 12. And verse 7, we read this. Daniel 12, verse 7 says, And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever that it shall be for time, times, and a half, and when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So again, we just see this common thing, the raising of the hand, it's to swear a solemn oath. So back again in chapter 10, that's exactly what's going to take place. An oath is going to be made. And so it says, verse 5, the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things that therein are, that there should be time no longer. So the, the oath uh, is solemn. It's comprehensive. It includes both 
uh, the creator and his creation. It is by him that created the heaven, the things that are therein, the earth, the things that are therein, the sea, the things that are therein. This is the whole material universe is embraced in this oath. By the way, it puts an end once and for all for the evolutionary lie that has been perpetrated for 150 years. What does it tell us? He swore by him that lives for an ever, ever and ever who created heaven and the things that are therein, the earth, the things that are therein, the sea, the things that are therein, that there should be time no longer. This the, it swears by the creator. It's good to, again, folks, I think the creation and the the taking, accepting God on creation is critical. Uh, and it's undermined constantly, even amongst uh, in Christian circles, people doubting uh, the Genesis account. And I feel it's very destructive. And yet here, God, uh, this angel is, is swearing by him that created. So again, another, what we might say, a logical difficulty of this angel being Christ. Remember we're saying we, we just have a real difficulty with the interpretation that this is speaking of Christ. Because um, who is creator? <laughs> He's swearing by him that created heaven and earth. Uh, and um, uh, certainly the angel isn't the creator of things that are in heaven and earth. Christ is. And Hebrews tells us men verily swear by the greater. The angel admits in swearing that God is greater than he. And yet when it comes to the Lord Jesus, he is creator. And he could say, I and the father are one. And so, again, another piece of evidence that would suggest this angel is just, a, as it says, a mighty angel. He is not Christ at all, but he is swearing by him. And what is the announcement? What is the big thing? Swearing by, by the one that created the whole of the universe, the material universe. He says that time should be no longer. Now, evidently, this does not mean time ceases altogether as we have at least a thousand years of time still left, right? We've got the millennial kingdom uh, after Christ returns. And so it simply means that um, that delay, I think the Derby translation puts it that, there shall be delay no longer. In other words, the long promise of Christ's return is finally going to happen. Uh, this promise that has been given over 2,000 years ago is about to be fulfilled. And so he says that, that there should be time no longer, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, in other words, when the seven trumpet sounds, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And so, so much of scripture talks about until, you know, uh, uh, Genesis 49, 10, until Shiloh come. Well, those untils are about to be finally ended. Let me give you one more. First Timothy 6, the appearing of Christ. Uh, First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 16, who only hath, it, it, let me see, verse 14. 6.14, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that until is finally coming to an end. The time of anticipation and long waiting is just about to be over. Uh, delay is going to be no longer. Uh, in the days when the seventh trumpet sounds, uh, Christ is coming back to take up uh, his rightful place as Christ the Messiah, the ruler of the entire planet. And so that's the idea. There's no turning back. God's program is in motion and delay is going to be no longer. When that seventh angel sounds, of course, the seventh angel opens the seven last judgments. And then at the end of that, Christ comes back and we're into the reign of Christ. And so the angel claims the entire world, land and sea, for God and announces the imminent return of Christ. 
there's absolutely no turning back. Just waiting for the seventh angel to sound his trumpet. So we might ask the question, why has there been this delay of the coming of Christ? It's been promised for a long time, and yet uh, it, it, it still hasn't arrived. He said, I come quickly, and yet he's not here yet. And of course, in the last days, people are going to mock that and say, well, where's the promise of his coming? And there are two reasons for the delay. One is Second Peter 3, verse 9, where it says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So part of the delay is that he's allowed the, the day of grace to continue so that men can be saved. And then there's a second reason for the delay. And I want to suggest back in Genesis 15 and verse 16, that God also allows before judgment, he allows people's sin to ripen till it's at its fullest. Genesis 15 verse 16, it says in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. This is the children of Israel. And of course, God's going to give them the land of Canaan because he says, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. <laughs> and, and so what we could say is this, that, that the, the delay is this. Before God's final judgments come, he is allowing sin to ripen to its fullest. <laughs> so there'll be no question in his justice in judging the world for their sin. He's allowing it just as he did with the, the Canaanites to reach its full capacity before judgment comes. And then on the other hand, he's delaying because he's not willing that any should perish, that people are still being saved, even though sin is abounding. Grace does still super abound and he still saves. Now, here's an amazing thing. I was talking to my wife about this as we were uh, discussing this chapter together. And I said to her, as you look at our world, it must be very close. Because sin is certainly ripened and is it's hard to imagine it being much more worse and decadent than it already is now. So it must be close uh, when this judgment comes. Notice again, back in our passage, it says, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. What does this mean? The mystery of God should be finished. Look, you know, we know that mystery means something that has been hidden, but now revealed. Colossians chapter two and verse two, Colossians two. Again, let's allow scripture to interpret scripture, it says, <clears throat> Colossians 2, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. The mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. Could we suggest that what the, the mystery of God is, is the full revelation of Christ. In other words, when the Lord Jesus comes, now we by faith have believed that Jesus is the Christ, but the world still rejects him. But the mystery of God, in other words, all of God's kind of purposes are all headed up in this one person, the Lord Jesus. And when he comes, the, the mystery of God will be finished. People will see what he had planned all together in the person of the Lord Jesus. Now, what, what kind of strengthens this uh, view is if you look at chapter 11, we're jumping ahead again, but you remember he says the, the, when, the fifth, when the seventh angel sounds in verse seven, the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. So look at eleven fifteen. And it says, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And so when that seventh angel sounds, it's announcing Christ is going to reign. He's coming, <laughs> right? It's the announcement of that. The mystery of God will be finished. 
all, in a sense, all that is being hidden about God is going to be fully revealed to the world in the person of the Lord Jesus. And of course, the Lord Jesus is the full revelation. You want to know what the Father's like? Remember what he said to Philip? You've seen the Father. You've seen me. You've seen the Father. And so the manifestation of divine righteousness, holiness, power, and love, all of which have been real to faith in all ages, will now become visible and tangible in the person of Christ reigning on the earth. So it says, and the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went up unto the angel and said to him, give me the little book. Now, again, just want to ask you this question. If this was really Christ, what did John do when he saw the glorified Christ in chapter one? Fell on his face as a dead man. And now he's going to walk up and just say, give me the little book. I mean, I just, I mean, even the very language of it, give me the little book. I'm sorry. This is, this is not the Lord Jesus at all. Give me the little book. And he said to me, take it, eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. So let's just read verse 10. I took the little book out of the angel's hands and I ate it up and it was in my mouth, sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> this is not the first time that we have this analogy of eating a book and it is both sweet to the taste and causes bitterness. Uh, if you look back at the book of Ezekiel, uh, we'll see a parallel. Actually, there's a lot of parallels between Ezekiel and Revelation. But Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 3. And again, um, there, there's a book uh, given. Um, if you look back at verse 8 of chapter 2. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And when I looked, verse 9, behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. He spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations, mourning, and woe. Moreover, verse 1, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest. Eat this roll and go speak. Uh, unto the house of Israel. And so he says, so I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said to me, son of man, cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. And so again, this idea of uh, sweetness to the taste and that's what he does. He eats it. It's sweet to the taste. And yet, uh, again, we see in uh, the scripture is is described in that way over and over again, isn't it? That we're we're told to to take in the word of God and that it's sweet. And so it, the message must be absorbed uh, and taken in. And it would give Ezekiel strength for the work yet to be done. Uh, and uh, certainly that's the, the thought that's in, in view uh, in Ezekiel, is to take it and, and eat it. But notice uh, chapter 3, verse 14. Uh, so the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness. In the heat of my spirit by the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. And so he eats it up, it gives him strength for the work, and yet uh, he goes in bitterness. So he got this idea, sweet and bitter. Scripture, again, we've said this yeah, again and again, talks about how sweet the word of God is to the believer. And so let's just look at some other quick references. Psalm 119, verse 103. I guess we could look at Psalm 19 as well. But Psalm 119, verse 103, it says this, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Uh, book of Jeremiah 
and verse 15, chapter 15, Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16 through 18. Jeremiah 15, 16, thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. And again, so God's word, sweet to the taste. And, it, and it's true, isn't it? Um, where the Lord Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And we use similar terminology about the idea of eating uh, the word of God. Uh, we'll, we'll use terms like this. Uh, we'll ask a brother, well, what have you been feeding on in the word recently? Uh, right? We might say, oh, uh, how did the meeting go? Or oh, they devoured the message. <laughs> Or uh, what do you think of that passage? Well, I'm still chewing on it. <laughs> and so we use that kind of language all the time. And of course, the idea is this, that we are to constantly be feeding on the word of God. And I hope, we're, I hope we had a spiritual breakfast this morning, even before coming on here, that we, we fed on the word, that we, we, we valued the word of God. And yet, here's the interesting thing. It's sweet to our taste, and it, and it is a wonderful thing, isn't it, that God has taken us in to his confidence in telling us about the future. I find that quite remarkable, that the God of heaven has revealed to us all of his future plans uh, re right here in the book of Revelation. I find that quite remarkable, and, and I find it a joy to be able to study these things and think about these things. And to think here we are, sinners of the Gentiles, and God has taken us into his confidence and shown us what he intends to do. And, you know, many of us uh, before in our unsaved days, we would we'd sit on bar stools and we'd pontificate about the, the way the world is going. And, but we had no idea of what God's plan or purpose was. We were just, uh, you know, kind of barroom philosophers. And here we are now. Sinners of the Gentiles, gloriously saved, have been taken into God's confidence about what he intends to do in the future. And yet there's a certain sense that it's so sweet to read the word of God and to mull it over and take it in. And yet there's an aspect of it that is very bitter. And that is this. John is taking this book, which is an indictment upon the earth. And it's about God's future judgments. And included in those future judgments are John's own people. Two-thirds of them are going to be wiped out by the time this is all over. And so there's a, the, the word of God is so sweet to us, and yet there's a bitterness to it. Because it tells us what is going to happen to those that reject the gospel. What is going to happen to our loved ones? That, that refuse the offer of salvation, where are they going to be? Is that not bitterness to your soul to think that our loved ones might spend an eternity in the lake of fire, having gone through this time of great tribulation first, and then going into an eternity without Christ? And so on the one hand, there's a delightful sweetness to the word of God for the child of God. But there's a bitterness connected with it too, because this is a book of judgment. So as he assimilated it, what was entailed in this book, especially concerning the last three and a half years of the tribulation period, bitterness wrenched in his inward parts. The little book demanded judgment upon mankind, and very especially on John's own nation. And so his belly was bitter so verse 11 he said unto me thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and and kings uh, tongues and kings and so john's job is far from over he still has more work to do he has still more prophetic utterances to deliver to us as he's given them from god uh, and so uh, Notice, too, that what he has to deliver is to do with everyone. This must prophesy again before 
many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. It's pertinent to all levels of society. Everybody's going to be affected by these things. And so it has all of these in view. Now we, we come nicely into chapter 11. And we said we're in a parenthetical time. And what we're doing, it's kind of like, if I can put it this way, this might help us a little bit in understanding Revelation. <laughs> Now, when we were uh, homeschooling our children, we we did a thing. We, we, we used to call these unit studies. And what we do is uh, just use an example. We talk about, say, the American Civil War. And in that unit study, we'd have the chronological sequence of events from the very beginnings at Fort Sumner all the way through to the conclusion. And so you'd you'd have the chronological flow. But occasionally, in the middle of doing the chronology, you would stop and look at some of the people. So you might look at Stonewall Jackson or Abraham Lincoln or, or George Grant or some of the different ones. You see, you'd, you'd kind of stop and look at the people. And then you look at some of the places where all this happened. You'd look at Virginia. You'd look at Gettysburg. You'd look at some of these battle places. And so that's what we're doing in the book of Revelation. The main chronological flow is seen in the seals, the trumpets, and the bold judgments. But occasionally, he stops the action and he says, okay, the people, well, who's going to survive this? Uh, is anybody going to survive? We looked at that in chapter 7. And now we're stopping and we're saying, what about the places? Well, We've seen in chapter 10, the whole of creation now is being claimed for Christ. And judgment is coming on this created world because of man's rebellion. And now chapter 11, he's going to narrow it down. And he's going to focus our attention, not on creation in general, but on the city in particular. And when we talk about the city, there's only one city in view here. It's the city of Jerusalem. And so he's going to focus our attention on the city. And as we look at chapter 11, uh, we want to, we'll divide it up quite simply. Uh, we're going to look at verses 1 and 2, worship in the temple. We're going to see that there'll be a temple that will be rebuilt during this time of the tribulation. So we're going to look at worship in the temple, verse 1 and 2. And then from verse 3 down to verse 13, we're going to look at witnesses in the city. We're going to look at two witnesses who are going to witness in this city for the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. And then from verse 15 to 18, we're going to see wrath on the earth uh, because we're going to notice verse 18 says the nations were angry. That's the word wrath and thy wrath is come <laughs> and the time of the dead that they should be judged. So, so wrath on the earth, worship in the temple, witness in the city, wrath on the earth so he's going to talk about jerusalem <clears throat> on the one hand as he talks about jerusalem it, it's going to be a vile place spiritually in the last days in fact he calls it in verse 8 he says their dead bodies shall be in the street of the great city which spiritually is called sodom and egypt <laughs> where also our Lord was crucified. So it's certainly going to be a very vile place spiritually. In fact, God's going to liken it to both Sodom and Egypt because of the idolatry. You see, the abomination of desolation is going to be set up there in that city. And, and therefore, it, it will be a place of idolatry and of, of the rule of uh, malevolent uh, power, just like Pharaoh. And so certainly like Sodom and Egypt. But he also is going to call it the holy city. <laughs> if you look at verse 2, the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall be tread underfoot forty and two months. So vile spiritually, and yet still the holy city. Now, how can that be? Well, Again, it's this idea of standing and state. <laughs> In God's purpose, 
This is the holy city in the sense that it's been set apart for him. It's the city of the great king. It's the city where Jesus was will reign. The very city where he is crucified is the city where he will make the capital of the world empire that he will reign over. So, so uh, as, as far as state is concerned, that city is set apart for him. As far as stand, uh, 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 it, sorry, standing, it's set apart for him. As far as its condition, uh, it's a very wicked place right now. And so uh, the day is going to come when the two will come together. And it will then become the joy of the whole earth. That city of the great king will become the joy of the whole earth when these things come together. So it's going to be the scene of the last day's idolatry of the human race because the lord says in matthew 24 verse 15 when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by daniel the prophet stand in the holy place whoever readeth let him understand so this place is going to be the place where this last stand of idolatry will take place in the last days um by the way, let's just think a minute about this idol. I want you to look at chapter 13, Revelation 13. We're jumping ahead a little bit. But again, this city is going to be the scene of this idolatry. It says in verse 14, I looked and behold. That's chapter 14, chapter 13, verse 14. It says. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And it says he had power to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed so this is the idolatry that is going to come in that holy city in the last days it'll be the most sophisticated idol ever seen in the in the history of humanity it will have all the wonders of modern technology including artificial intelligence but behind it all is going to be nothing more than demonic satanic power <laughs> and it's going to be quite the image so much so that it will be deceptive and cause the world to bow and worship before it and yet in the midst of this scene of idolatry what we're going to see in this chapter is that god is not going to leave himself without a witness in fact he's going to have two witnesses that are going to testify during this dark time period so let's read verse one. It says, there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. So he's told to measure with this measuring rod. Again, the word and connects it with the, the previous chapter. Perhaps the idea is this, that it's the mighty angel is still telling him these details. And maybe the angel gives him this reed like unto a rod and says, rise, measure the temple of God. Now, these reeds or rods were picked from the swamps of the Jordan Valley, and they could grow up to 20 feet long, but they're cut in 12 foot lengths. So six meters long or 3.7 meter lengths for measuring purposes. And they're connected with measuring out a property. So he's commanded to rise up and measure three things. He says, rise and measure the temple of God and then the altar and then the worshipers in the temple. Now, here's what's so interesting. When John is writing this book in AD 95, 
there is no temple. It was destroyed in AD 70 by the Roman general Titus. So the Lord is leaving us in no doubt that there will be a rebuilt temple, a trip, what we call the tribulation temple. And we see a lot of references to this because this is going to be the scene where the man of sin will come and declare himself to be God. Let me just give you a couple of New Testament references. Matthew 24, again, lots of parallels between Matthew 24 and verse 15 through 18. Already hinted at it, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let them understand. Then them that which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let them which are in the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let them which is in the field return back for his clothes, so on and so forth. So clearly, a temple, a holy place, the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Verses three and four it says this, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there be a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, all that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And let me just say, by way of an aside, uh, some of our dear a millennial friends try to say that this temple is the church. Well, can you imagine the man of sin sitting in the church, <laughs> showing himself that he is God? I don't think so. This is a rebuilt tribulation temple. Now, what's interesting, uh, we should be of interesting interest to us, is that this temple may be built much sooner than we think. There are people working feverishly in Israel, the Temple Institute being one, who have already got all the furniture for the te temple built. They're ready to go. Uh, the priestly garments, everything's, I mean, they are, they're chomping at the bit to build this temple. And so I, I suspect that it will not take long. As soon as the go-ahead is given, that thing will be built like you have never seen. A it'll be like an Amish barn going up overnight. It'll be up in no time. And so this temple is going to be the scene of some amazing events. But time has gone. We'll have to wait till next week to continue with this. May God encourage us with the fact that the Lord is coming and that time will be no longer or delay no longer.